A very good afternoon to all the students of class 11. Today I'm going to take on the lesson Landscape of the Soul written by Natalie Tarubroy. Now, as the title suggests, I would first uh, talk about the word landscape. Now, landscape, uh, the literal meaning uh, which we take is all the visible features of an area. You know, for example, uh, you can talk in terms of uh, uh, a forest, plains, mountains, rivers, valleys. So that refers to uh, a landscape. And in short, in one word, if I have to define it, I would say scenery of an area. Now here, we are focusing more on what the Chinese painter or Chinese artist wants to convey through his paintings. And that is the landscape of the soul. Now, what is the soul? The soul, the spirit, that's the spiritual part of a person, uh, which is believed uh, to give life to a body. So uh, it's an abstract kind of uh, a theory, but uh, we need to understand because the beauty lies uh, not in the outward physical features of an area, or if we say the physical features of a human being. The actual beauty lies within and we have to look at that beautiful aspect and uh, evolve as a, a beautiful human being. Okay, And uh, we all know that the soul is the spiritual or the uh, you know immaterial part of human body or animal and regarded as immortal. You've all heard Atma to Amarotiya. Shirir Nashwar Hota Hai. I mean, the body perishes, the body dies, but the soul is immortal. Wo amar hai. Okay. So, uh, the landscape uh, or the painting that they're talking about, it's a depiction of a natural scenery in art. As I told you about mountains, valleys, water bodies, and forests and coasts, and also man made structures and uh, people as well. You know, if you see the a painting you know of uh, depicting mountains and a river flowing and then there are uh, people uh, you know working in the adjoining areas or somebody's there in a boat so it also includes people uh, now in the earliest ancient and classical periods uh, paintings included uh, the natural scenic element and the landscape is an independent genre which emerged after the Renaissance in the 16th century. If you've done it in history, Renaissance, that is rebirth, when there was a you know revival of all uh, art, literature, and things like that. You know because there was a lapse before that. You know the Dark Ages, the Dark Period, and then came the Renaissance when there was a rebirth of all this, and from then on, uh, we started developing and progressing, where uh, there was actual growth in terms of uh, all spheres, you know, like science and uh, literature and uh, other fields also. Uh, now, a man actually lives a dual life, both at the physical and the spiritual level. And uh, the title highlights the inner divine beauty of man. That is the title, Landscape of the Soul, okay? When you're talking about the landscape of an area, whether it is a mountainous land or it's plain land or there's a river flowing or it's a coastal area. But here the focus is on the landscape of the soul. That is the title highlights the inner divine beauty of man. Okay, now um, in your uh, text, there are certain uh, expressions given in the beginning, uh, the word anecdote, then illusionistic likeness, delicate realism, conceptual space, and figurative painting. Now, before we begin, we just like to uh, just like to give you uh, you know the meanings briefly. Now, anecdote is a short, uh, interesting, or amusing story about uh, you know uh, a real incident or um, a person. That's an anecdote. Then uh, second one, an illusionistic likeness. Now this is uh, the technique of using pictorial methods in order to deceive the eye. 
it, an illusion is created, you know, it deceives the eye and you see beyond that, okay. Then the third one talks of delicate realism. Now, delicate realism, it refers to the alluring or tempting quality of the art which makes it seem real, okay. Concern for the real or actual as opposed to the to the abstract. Then we come on to uh, conceptual space. Now this uh, term uh, is in relation with the, the abstract than the conceptual uh, representation through art. Okay. Then we talk about figurative painting. Now, figurative, like uh, we also have, uh, you must have done that terminology in for poetry. Uh, we talk about the literal meaning and the metaphorical meaning, you know. So, figurative painting also refers to a metaphoric representation of art through the eyes of the creator's imagination. So, these are some of the terms that have been used in this chapter. Now, uh, there are about uh, two or three anecdotes that they have taken and uh, in uh, in this chapter we also it's also highlighted that how uh, you know stories were a medium where the master used to narrate stories to his disciples to make the meaning of what he wanted to convey very clear and so that it could actually reach the disciples and reach the people uh, who were listening so, and story, in a, like we have these moralistic stories and these fairy tales and various things for children, which give a message. So here also, uh, in the, the first story that they have taken up is about the emperor, uh, Zhuan Zhang, and he asked his uh, painter, Wu Daozi, to, you know, uh, paint uh, a landscape to decorate, to adorn or decorate one of his palace walls. Now, uh, the painter uh, immediately, I mean, you know, worked on his on this project and to complete, fulfill his master's wish, and he did so. And then he called the uh, the emperor to come and have a look at it. Now the emperor came and he admired the wonderful uh, scene, and he saw, you know, forests over there. He saw high mountains. He saw waterfall. He saw clouds floating in an immense sky and men who were there on the hilly paths and uh, there were birds flying and uh, then the painter when he saw that the, the emperor was admiring every aspect of what he had created then the painter said uh, pointed to the emperor to look at the cave which he had made at the foot of the mountain and then he says this cave and that there dwells a spirit and the painter clapped his hands and the entrance to the cave opened and uh, the painter went inside and, uh, you know, and the, uh, the, the entrance to the cave closed behind him. And uh, before the astonished emperor could even utter a word or, you know, any kind of an exclamation, uh, the painter had disappeared and the painting which was there on the wall also disappeared. And there was no trace of the painter and they believe that the artist was never seen again. Now, uh, the main idea behind uh, this story is that he wanted the emperor to look at that picture beyond the illustration that was there on the panel on the screen. He, he did not want him to see only the mountains, the forest, the water, the people. He wanted him, he wanted the emperor to see something beyond that, you know, not the external or the outward beauty, but he wanted him to look at the beauty within. He wanted the emperor to look at that picture from all angles, you know, and uh, to actually, you know, use both his physical presence as well as his mental presence to admire that picture and to actually become a part of that picture not only physically but also mentally okay then uh, we proceed and move on uh, further <clears throat> uh, and this is what is highlighted here in this uh, 
uh, Chinese painting and in, in Chinese, you know what the, the painter's art, the painter does not want the viewer to choose a single viewpoint. His landscape is not a real one. He's drawn everything, but it is not a real one. And you can enter it from any point and then travel in it. The artist creates a path for the viewer's eyes to travel upon, up and down, then back again in a leisurely movement. You know, to get into it. Like, for example, you're looking at a mountain. Now, just don't look at that mountain as a piece of land that is standing there. Look at the things uh, beyond the physical aspect of the mountain, the sturdiness, the firmness, okay, of that mountain. Similarly, there's a river flowing. It's just not an expanse of water, but see the fluidity of water, how it moves, it comes and then it reaches its destination. It does not stop on its way. It, uh, you know, overcomes all obstacles that come in its path. So metaphorically, the importance of all those things. <coughs> this is what uh, the idea of Wu Daozi uh, was to, uh, you know, have that cave. Now that cave, like outward body, but that cave is that inner being, that inner soul, okay? So he wanted the emperor to enter that cave and look at the beauty beyond that screen. So that is what is called, uh, you know, uh, looking within, okay? And uh, why this is, uh, this chapter is, uh, you know, important in that sense, as the title suggests, the purpose of the soul. Now, the soul acts as a link between the material body and, you know, the material body is mortal. It perishes, it dies and the spiritual self, the soul, which is, you know, uh, immortal. Now, the soul can be attracted either towards the spiritual or towards the materialistic world or materialistic aspect. Uh, Thus, it becomes a kind of a battlefield of good and evil. So what the painter wanted to show or the painters in that period wanted to, uh, uh, you know, tell the viewers was look beyond that and look at the beauty of the soul. Make your soul beautiful just as a landscape is mesmerizing, you know. When we go on a holiday, we look at the scenic beauty around, you know, and we click pictures and, you know, it's immortalized in our minds forever. You know, it becomes a memory for us. Similarly, if our soul is beautiful, you know, the body automatically becomes beautiful. If there is love, compassion, uh, kindness, empathy, sensitivity in the heart and the soul, you're a good human being. So not because physical beauty perishes. Nobody remains like, you know, you're young today and slowly with the passage of time, uh, you grow and you uh, tend to get older and older day by day. And, you know, your skin starts shriveling up, withering, you have wrinkles and, you know, so all that kind of thing. So that is perishable. But the soul is immortal and that soul should be beautiful from within. So that is the purpose of the soul because the soul keeps the body alive that way. So we must keep our inner beauty, you know, always intact and we should work on that beauty, not uh, in terms of the physical beauty. Okay, then uh, <clears throat> according to uh, this uh, painter that we've just spoken about, uh, Wu Daozi, uh, you know, we uh, in... Uh, He's linked with the Taoist view, okay? Now, Taoism was recognized, uh, uh, has, sorry, Taoism has recognized two uh, contrasting but complementary elements in the universe, namely Yang and Yin, okay? Now, Yang is active, uh, masculine, stable, firm, warm, and dry. Whereas yin is supposed to be receptive, is supposed to be feminine, is supposed to be fluid, moist and cool. Now, according to the features described here, 
masculine, stable, warm, dry, firm. Now all these attribute to the mountains, okay? And fluidity, feminine, moist, cool, receptive, that stands for the feminist part, that is the river. So landscape is basically the combination of these two. They are contrasting, but they complement each other, okay? Because one is vertical, and that's the mountain, and water flows, so that is horizontal. So they are contrasting, but at the same time, they are complementary elements in the universe, okay? So that was the theory, that the Taoist view. Now in this, then uh, they talk about uh, these two elements being there, okay? And this is referred also to the concept as expressed in the Shan Shui. You know, that, that is mountain water, okay? Shan Shui, that means mountain water. So these two elements are there, okay? Uh, one is vertical, one is horizontal, you know, the mountain and the water, the yang and the yin. Now, there is another third element that they talk about, which is generally overlooked. And what is that third element? That is the middle void, the middle void. Now, just as they've given the example of pranayam, you inhale and then you exhale. But that split second in between when you're, you know, when you've inhaled and just the moment that you exhale, that little gap that is there, that is called the middle void. Now, this middle void refers to the emptiness or the thin line of difference between the real and illusion. Okay? The painter vanished inside his own painting, okay, which was that of an illusion. It was a visionary hallucination which was created on a three-dimensional frame. The white unpainted space in Chinese landscape represents the middle void. The white patches are the, that are there in the landscape that represents the middle void. So the middle void is man's space. Man's space. Man is the conduit or the link of communication between both poles of the universe and man's presence is essential and he is the eye of the landscape or eye of the landscape so the middle void you know it's a thin dividing line between the real okay and the illusion sorry a thin dividing line between the real and the illusion, okay? And uh, the part that, you know, where the, uh, in the book also, the text, it says that the yogic practice of pranayama, you breathe in, you retain, and then you breathe out. Now, the suspension of breath, okay? The, the time when you are retaining it, the suspension, you're neither breathing in nor breathing out, you know, so you're retaining it, you're suspending it there. So the suspension of breath is that void where meditation occurs, where you're in, you know, uh, in union or in communion with the divine, okay? And this is what the middle void is about, okay? Uh, now, I repeat once again, uh, the painter made the emperor look at the cave in the painting and compared it to a living spirit. As the painter clapped his hands, the cave opened and he let the emperor know how beautiful the inside of the cave was. Now, the Chinese painter does not paint a landscape from one point of view only. That is, means only from the beauty point of view, the physical aspect. He wants his viewer to be a part of his painting both physically and mentally. The viewer can enter the painting mentally and spiritually. And the painters, they all highlighted that the inner beauty is more important than the outward beauty. Okay? And what the, like the spiritual purpose behind that, you know, of looking into the soul, making the soul beautiful, 
What, why is that important? Uh, the spiritual purpose is not connected to anything material. It means to establish a set of values, principles and beliefs that give life meaning. You know, that gives life a meaning to you. And then use them to guide your decisions and actions that you take. So all beliefs and all good things, you know, that you do. And so that your life, you know, moves according to these beautiful principles and beautiful, uh, you know, uh, actions that you take. To be a good person, to be content, to be empathetic, to be compassionate, etc. And this is, this spirit is that part of us that connects us to God. Okay, so this is very, very important. Then the other story that they have uh, in your text is a, a short one they have given that, you know, um, there was another painter who had uh, drawn a dragon, but he never uh, drew the eye of the dragon for fear that it would fly out of the painting. And this was an old story from uh, uh, the native Flanders that uh, found most representative of Western painting. Here we talked about Chinese painting. This was about the Western painting. So they looked at it only from that aspect, the outward aspect only. That if the eye was there, now supposing the Chinese had drawn something like that, they would, you know, uh, maybe have the eye and through the eye they would penetrate and go to another phase or another world or another realm you know so that is the different okay then uh, they have spoken about uh, uh, this uh, blacksmith called uh, Quinton Amesis who fell in love with a painter's daughter and uh, this Antwerp it is a city in Belgium and we are talking about uh, the you know after the renaissance period he was a painter uh, in the renaissance period as i told you after the dark ages okay now uh, this blacksmith he blacksmiths are uh, people who uh, you know work with iron ironsmith or blacksmith and he fell in love with the painter's daughter now the painter thought that you know he could never marry his daughter off to a blacksmith because he did not consider the match to be among uh, equals and he didn't want a son-in-law uh, to be a person of that profession but uh, you know um, this Quinton this blacksmith what he did was uh, he quietly secretly he went into the painter's studio and he painted a fly on his latest panel you know on his screen and with such delicate realism delicate realism means that it was almost real as good as being real and when the master came in when the painter came in he actually believed that fly to be real and he tried to swat it but then he realized that it was a painting that it was a painted fly so when he saw that uh, realism in that painting in that little fly that that boy had made that uh, you know the blacksmith had made he immediately consented and he took him in as an apprentice as a beginner and then later on with the passage of time uh, Quinton also became uh, one of the famous painters of that period of the renaissance period okay now, these two stories illustrate that each form of art is trying to achieve a perfect illusionistic likeness. Okay, that means whatever is that illusion, it was not real, the drawing is not real, okay, the painting is not real, but the effect that they're trying to create is illusionistic likeness, okay, and uh, that means, uh, you know, they're trying to show to the viewer that it is as good as real they want to deceive the eye so that was uh, you know the the idea behind the painters of the western uh, uh, of the western painters they want they painted they pay whatever they painted they tried to give it a real look an illusionistic look you know and the european painters they wanted their viewers to look at the painting only from that point of view 
that the painter saw the painting. So the painter wanted to borrow the eyes of all the people who saw it. You know, he wanted everybody to look at that painting just as he looked at it. He did not want the viewers to look at it from different angles or to go, you know, beyond the physical aspect of that. So that was the difference between the Chinese and the Western painters. The Chinese wanted the viewers to penetrate deeper and look at the deeper aspect of the painting, whereas the Western painters, they wanted the viewers to look at it just as the painter wanted to project it. So that was the difference between the Chinese and the Western. Okay. Then uh, the other thing that they have about Shantri, I've just spoken to you, talks about mountain water. Yes, then we come on to another aspect that the text has spoken about. Okay, so as you, we've heard about the Chinese, we've heard about the Western painting. Now there was another aspect that came up much later and uh, that was by uh, Jean Dubuffet who promoted the raw art. He promoted the raw art, raw art or art brood. Now what is art brood? This was, you know, um, art or the creation made by artists who had no uh, training, formal training. Uh, but they all exhibited, you know, artistic insight and aptitude towards art or they were very talented, though they had not received any formal training. Okay. And uh, art group, this is a French term and it was in, invented by Jean uh, Dubuffet. And it's a French term uh, that means that raw art outside the academic tradition, tr uh, traditional art you know so they had no formal training so this was a very good aspect because not everybody has the chance of maybe getting that formal training and there are people who without the formal training are uh, naturally gifted you know they're born with that talent so in those terms they could also uh, produce uh, things or you know uh, create things with their artistic talent despite uh, not having any uh, formal training and the biggest example that they have given over here uh, with whom you can relate is actually Nick Chen, uh, you know the rock garden that he created uh, in Chandigarh it's so beautiful and so many people from all over the world come and visit it and you know he's been rewarded and he's been honored and it's a great creation and uh, you know, you can imagine his creativity and his imagination because he has used all, you know, uh, all broken things and things that were lying waste. So instead of, you know, being dumped in a heap or a garbage heap or something, each article, each object was used uh, in terms of creating something new, creating something unique. And uh, for that, uh, you know, uh, we all are proud that, you know, this Indian has been honored. So Nate Chand, I mean, he has uh, featured on the, the magazines and, you know, um, then there was an interactive show at the realm of Nate Chand and, uh, you know, he's really been honored and he's made us all proud. And uh, it's a great inspiration for uh, youngsters, you know, to uh, actually come up with new innovative ideas and not only depend on uh, new material and things, but use and recycle things uh, that are lying waste and can, uh, you know, be, uh, uh, one can be creative and use them constructively, okay? So that was basically what the chapter was all about. So we have the Taoist view, then we have Shan Shui, then we have, uh, okay. Now, uh, in this, just I would just like to, uh, you know, tell you one or two things in addition to what I have just spoken. And, uh, you know, that 
there are what are the famous forms of art you should know you know this is just general knowledge that uh, you know there are seven uh, forms of art and number one painting which we all know about painting then number two sculpture number three literature number four architecture number five cinema number six music and number seven theater painting we all know we are well aware of uh, you know how paintings are made and colors used and things like that it could be about uh, nature it could be human beings it could be places it could be structures any form of painting then uh, we talk about sculptures that are three dimensional okay visual images and clay is used and stone is used or ceramic or metal or wood or glass all these are used and uh, you must be knowing uh, you know the the statue of liberty is such a i mean the, the i'm using giving an example of the common ones okay then we come on to literature now literature in all great works of literature uh, you know all the writers they have very creatively used the art of writing through the organization of words okay beautiful poetry beautiful drama beautiful prose so it's all beautiful words that are woven together then we come on to architecture okay so uh, architecture is you know structures that are created and uh, beautiful structures that uh, have come up art structures you know for example uh when we talk in terms of all the some of the wonders of the world the great pyramids and then you have the taj mahal then you have the opera house in sydney they're all beautiful pieces of architecture and the mughal architecture in india also i mean they are worth mentioning then we talk about cinema okay now uh, cinema uh, this is the newest form of art you know it's not very old and uh, it engages our audio and uh, visual senses okay then uh, sixth is music now music is where sounds and vibrations are used to give melody harmony rhythm and uh, etc and along with uh, using the voice and the instruments then we come on to the seventh one theater theater it's a combination of both visual uh art and drama dramatic performances so these are all you know you have performing arts also so these are so all of them combined there are seven forms of art now uh then if if i just ask you from gk point of view that you know name some of the some of the uh, leading artists uh, famous indian painters so just to give it to you amrita shergill was very well known renowned and from 1913 to 1941 then uh, makbool fida hussain mf hussain 1915 to 2011 and we all know that how he was smitten by madhuri dikshit you know okay then we talk about uh, said haider raza, uh, raza 1922 to 2016 then we also talk about raja ravi verma from 1848 to 1906 you must know some of the indian painters also and famous artists from europe you all are familiar with the leonardo da vinci then pablo picasso then michael angelo they were you know renowned then chinese painters these names are a little new fan quan then dong yuang and uh, huang gongwan so uh, these are some of you know this is just for gk point of view and you must know okay so with that i think the chapter we have almost completed it i'll just do the question and answers with you okay uh now uh, what do you have to say about chinese art okay now chinese art it broadens horizons it reveals itself like a horizontal scroll now what is a scroll you seen in the king's palaces when a message is come the scroll that you know you wind it up like that now horizontal scroll is when they used to paint you know it's folded so when uh, they open up the painting so they didn't open up the whole thing you know first part then that would they would roll it back and then the next part of the painting would come okay so it broadens horizons and it reveals itself like a horizontal scroll then it adds dimension of time 
the action of slowly opening one sector, one portion and then the other. Then it also gives the uh, liberty or freedom to the viewer, you know, to set his pace, the speed to travel through the landscape. Then uh, the Chinese artist does not want the onlooker to borrow his eyes to see it and just like the western artists they borrowed everybody's eyes because they wanted everybody to see it according to their thought but the chinese art it gives them the freedom to look at the painting or look at the art form from all aspects all angles you know different angles and to get involved with that art form not only physically by being there, but also penetrating it mentally. Okay. Then, uh, uh, next question. The Taoist view of creation. Write something on it, you know. Now, uh, the word Tao, D-A-O, it implies both the path and the method. Okay, both the path and the method. And according to uh, the involvement with creation, according to Taoist view, creation according to him of the universe, it takes place through the interaction of yin, which is the receptive feminine aspect of the universal energy and its counterpart yang, the active masculine force. And the third element, which is generally ignored, is very important. That is the middle void where the actual interaction takes place okay the void is like the suspension of breath in yogic pranayama breathe in retain and breathe out so that retaining where there is no breathing at all you know so that's the middle void the void is very essential nothing can happen without it like the white unpainted space in chinese landscape that is supposed to be the middle void. Then, uh, according to this view, man's role in art, you know, so man acts like a link between the uh, heaven and earth. Okay. Then he, man is the mode or medium of communication between the two poles. Okay. And uh, man's presence is a must. And as the admirer, the man, man is the eye of the landscape and uh, he can give a new dimension to the landscape painting. Okay, then we come on to the next question. Though it's a repeat, but I repeat it because the chapter pertains basically on this. It contrasts the Chinese view of art with the European view with examples. Now, the Chinese view of art does not choose a single point of view. Chinese art can be viewed from any angle, from all aspects altogether. The onlooker may enter it mentally and physically. The artist only helps the viewer to enter the landscape. And the beautiful example is the anecdote, anecdote of the, uh, the emperor and uh, Wu Daozi painting the landscape. Okay. The painter wanted the, the emperor or the viewer not to appreciate the outer appearance, but to enter his mind, his mind, the painter's mind. What, when the painter created that painting, what did he have in mind at that time when he created that piece of art? So it's actually entering the painter's mind and entering deeper into the the art created by uh, the artist but on the other hand the european or the western art makes a viewer to view the art from the viewpoint of the artist only limited okay the writer gives the example of the painting of a fly which was made by quinton the fly was so real that he was accepted as a disciple by the master painter whose daughter he wanted to marry so the fly that he created was not real but he it looked real so the illusionistic aspect was there to the fly okay it was not real but it was an illusionistic aspect okay 
Now, what is, explain the concept of Shan Shui. Now, the literal meaning of Shan Shui is mountain water, which used together stands for landscape. The mountain is Yang, reaching vertically towards heaven, and Yin is the, and it is, sorry, and it is stable, warm, dry uh, in the sun. It is active and masculine. But on the other hand, water is yin, it is horizontal, it is resting on the earth, it is fluid, moist and cool and it is feminine. Okay, These are the two complementary poles even though they are contrasting. One is vertical, one is horizontal. One is firm, strong, dry. The other one is wet, moist, cool. Okay. One is masculine, one is feminine. So that is how they are contrasting. But at the same time, they are complementary poles. Okay. And they represent, reflecting the Taoist view of the universe. And the middle void is essential. And it is the third element where the actual interaction takes place. Okay. And man is the link between uh, heaven and the earth and he's the eye of the landscape then the next question uh, how did stories play an important role in chinese classical education now these stories played an important role in chinese classical education because they were used to make the concepts clear to the pupils okay to the students okay such stories they were not only fanciful but they were also informative the stories in the books of Confucius and Zhuangzi. Now, these two were Chinese philosophers, renowned Chinese philosophers. And they helped the master or the teacher to guide his disciples, his students, in following the right direction. So, it was very, very important. Okay. Then we come on to... Who was Wu Daozi? What did he ask the emperor to do? Wu Daozi was a famous painter of China who lived in the 8th century and he asked the emperor to look into uh, a cave uh, that he had drawn uh, in his painting at the foot of the mountain where the spirit lived. Okay. Next question. Where does the greatness of Chinese art lie? Now, the Chinese art aimed at complete freedom to the viewer. It believed in multiple viewpoints. Okay, it did not want to project only the artist's point of view. So, it wanted uh, the viewer to see the landscape as he perceived it. Okay, and not as the art, how the artist perceived it. So, that freedom of time and space and of interpreting it. Okay, next question. Uh, why couldn't the painter paint the eye of a dragon? The painter could not paint the eye of the dragon because he felt uh, that, you know, if he painted it, uh, it would fly out of the painting. The painters of those days laid stress on the spirit of painting itself, you know. So if he drew the eye, it would it might might turn real, you know. So it was illusionistic, but they believed they wanted to believe that it was real. That is the Western point of view. Okay, next question. What is the difference between European art and Asian art? The Asian again, Chinese is you know same repeat only. The European art tries to achieve illusionistic likeness. A delicate realism but the Asian art tries to achieve the es essence of inner life and spirit okay next question what is the significance of the horizontal scroll now the horizontal scroll is significant in understanding the artistic viewpoint uh, where you open up one section of the painting rolling it up to move to the next one okay it requires an active participation of the viewer who is at liberty to move in time and space okay next question
What do you understand by the terms outsider art and art brute or raw art? The term art brute was given by the French painter Jean de Buffet during the 1940s. It refers to the art of the untrained visionary of minority vision. The term has given birth to outsider art. This genre is described as the art of those people who have received no formal training uh, of the art, yet they show talent and artistic insight. Their works are indeed stimulating, encouraging. Art brute or raw art stands for art in its raw state. It means that art which is under the influence of culture and art, but it has not risen to a matured stage or status as yet. Next question. Who was the untutored genius who created a paradise and what is the nature of his contribution to art? Now, Nate Chand, the creator of the rock garden at Chandigarh, is the untutored genius. Untutored, he's not received any formal training in this field. He has literally created a paradise in a little patch of jungle. He's widely hailed as India's biggest contributor to outsider art. He has used anything and everything from a tin to a sink to a broken down car as the material for work of art. He has made a single-handed contribution to art by using the waste and recycled material for art. He is an artist who has converted his dreams uh, to reality and a little jungle into a world that is the hub of artistic pleasure. His contribution is recognized by the Swiss Commission for UNESCO by arranging a European exposition of his works. Many other countries have also honored him for his contribution to art. A UK-based magazine devoted to outsider art, Raw Vision, has featured Nick Chand and his rock garden sculpture, Women by the Waterfall, on the cover of, the, of its anniversary issue. It is indeed a rare honor, you know, uh, for a person who has had no formal training in art. Next question. The emperor may rule over the territory he has conquered, but only the artist knows the way within. Discuss. Now, this uh, story uh, about the Chinese art reveals that the emperor may rule over the conquered territory, okay, the land. And understand the materialistic world, but he cannot understand or reach the inner world of the soul as does an art. Very important. Only the artist knows the way within. So the emperor asks an artist to make a landscape and all that. And you know, uh, everything beautiful. I'm not going to repeat all that. Um, you know, but then the... The painter, when he saw the king only praising and looking at the, the uh, outward aspect, he felt a little, uh, you know, unhappy. And so he clapped his hands and the entrance to the cave opened up and he uh, went in and then it closed behind him. And then the, uh, the uh, painting also vanished. So the emperor was stunned. He was taken aback. And the story underlines the fact about the Chinese art that outer reality is inconsequential. What is important to the Chinese art is the soul of the art. Okay, the soul of the art. What the what the artist had in mind when he was creating it. Not only look at the outward aspect of that, but to read the mind of the artist through his painting. So he wanted, that is what the painter wanted. That is what he wanted to show by, you know, opening up the cave. That open up, go deep within, go beyond the physical aspect and, you know, go deeper into, uh, you know, have a deeper insight uh, into that painting and see what the, the artist had in mind, what the creator had in mind when he was trying to create that art. Okay, next question. The landscape is an inner one. A spiritual and conceptual space. The Chinese painter has given full freedom to the viewer to look at his painting from any angle. 
On the other hand, the Western painter wants the viewer to use only his eyes to look at the landscape. To the Chinese uh, painter, the outer landscape does not matter much. The real uh, landscape is the inner one, covering a spiritual and conceptual space. In uh, it, one can enter from any point and travel in it up and down at his own leisurely pace. Okay, This means that the viewer of a Chinese landscape has to seek the beauty within. He ought to involve himself both physically and mentally in appreciating a real piece of art. Okay, So uh, that is what is depicted by Wu Daozi. That he wanted the viewer to enter his mind, okay, and see. For the landscape is not the outer reality, as the Western artist believes, but a spiritual and abstract reality. Okay, this uh, Yang and Yin you must have seen sometimes when you read your uh, horror, you know, your stars every weekend or so. Some magazines give it with that Yang masculine and Yin. So I'm sure you are quite familiar with the uh, with this terminology, yang and yin. Okay, you must know the full form of UNESCO also, you know, United Nations Education Scientific Cultural Organization. Okay, all right. So I think I have covered quite a bit of it, and I'm sure. Whatever I have done, you know, it will be beneficial to you all, okay? And uh, uh, the philosophers that I had mentioned, Confucius, uh, you know, uh, he was, uh, you know, a philosopher, uh, a politician, and also a teacher, and whose message of knowledge, benevolence, uh, you know, loyalty and virtue, they were the guiding philosophy of China for more than a thousand years, you know, so great. So I think children have tried to cover up and if you have any further queries, you're most welcome to, you know, uh, pin them down in the comment section and I will try to help you out. Thank you very much for watching, listening. Uh, God bless you all. And if you appreciate, please do like and share. I mean, your likes will be a motivating factor for me because that will show that, you know, I'm actually reaching across to you or not, or you appreciate it or not, you know. So everybody looks for appreciation, whether it's children or, you know, adults. So please do make my day and do share the video with as many uh, as you can, you know, because I think knowledge increases if you share it with the maximum number of people. Thank you so much, children. God bless you.